Good morning, and welcome to the First Parish Church of Stowe and Acton, a welcoming and spiritual community. My name is Karen Kinnear, and I facilitate the small group ministry program at First Parish. For those visiting the FPC for the first time, an extra welcome. Please let us know you are here by filling out one of our visitor information cards in the pews, hand it to an usher, drop it in the plate, or hand it to Meg, our welcoming staff member, or chat to one of us if you're online. Our minister, staff, and board are listed on the front of the order of service. Please feel free to ask me or any of those people for more information. If you would like a large print order of service or hymnal, or an assisted listening device, please ask our ushers. Our assisted listening devices are small radios, which anyone is welcome to use, one of those to listen to the service from any space in or around the building. After the service, please join us for coffee and conversation in our fellowship hall, which is one level down at the other end of our building, or in a breakout room if you're joining us online. I would like to draw your attention to the announcements in your order of service and also invite you to check out our webpage where you can find more information or sign up for our newsletter and email alerts. So for specific details, see your order of service. The family, the Valentine's Day family dance is going to be Saturday, January 20th from 1 to 3. Children are invited to bring their favorite adults for dancing, a card craft, and a treat. The new Revival Coffee House. Mike and Ruthie of the Mammals are back. There's a concert next Saturday, January 20th. So today's coffee hour is your last chance to buy tickets without an extra fee. Also see Johanna's email to sign up to bring desserts. So we have a very special Vesper service this month. We're going to have dinner at church. It's at FPC and it's co-hosted with the UC Marlboro Hudson. It's Friday, January 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. Please RSVP so we know how much food to make. The small group ministry registration for 2024 has been extended to next Sunday, um, January 21st. Small group ministry offers the opportunity to join a group of eight to 10 people who meet for two hours monthly for one year. That's 24 hours a year, not a big time commitment. We have facilitated discussions on topics chosen to increase our awareness of ourselves and connections to each other. So I personally have found that I have a special bond with anybody I've ever been in a group with and over 15 years, that's a lot of wonderful people. And I look forward to any opportunity to catch up with them. So it makes coffee hour a delight instead of something I cringe about. We are also looking for a couple of co-facilitators for 2024. All of our groups are facilitated by two people. So it's not an owner's job. Please check our SGM coffee hour table or online link in your order of service. And now let us come together for a time of community, singing and worship. Good morning. morning. Our opening words are by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, Marsha Rising is lighting our chalice this morning. This is from Loving Your Enemies, 1963. Returning hate for hate (laughs) multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate, violence multiplies violence, and toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. So when Jesus says, love your enemies, he is setting forth a profound and ultimately inescapable admonition. Have we not come to such an impasse in the modern world that we must love our enemies or else? Our opening hymn this morning is number 1029. This is in your teal hymnals. And please rise in body or in spirit. Love knocks and waits for us to hear.
covenant and affirmation words are in your order of service. Love is the spirit of this church, and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. kids or adults in our congregation want to join me up here for the message for all ages, I'd love to have you come up and join me. To conclude a little bit of that story for the rest of you of all ages, Martin Luther King said this, there is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution and there can be no gainsaying of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our world today. We see it in other nations, in the demise of colonialism. We see it in our own nation, in the struggle against racial segregation and discrimination. And as we notice this struggle, we are aware of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our midst. Victor Hugo once said that there is nothing more powerful in all the world than an idea whose time has come. The idea whose time has come today is the idea of freedom and human dignity. And so all over the world, we see a, something of a freedom explosion. And this reveals to us that we are in the midst of revolutionary times. An older order is passing away, and a new order is coming into being. I'm going to ask Karen Kinnear to share our land acknowledgment. We would like to acknowledge that this service is being held by a community that gathers on the stolen traditional lands of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Pawtucket, and Wampanoag people. We pay respects to those indigenous peoples who lost their lives in the colonization of this land, recognize that these indigenous tribes are still today facing violations of sovereignty, territory, and water. We also give thanks for the earth we walk upon, the waters, the life-giving plants, and all the earth's creatures, as well as the winds, sun, moon, and stars. We recognize this is just a first step in moving toward right relationship with native peoples and healing of the earth. This is our time in our service when we share our joys and sorrows. Those are those things that are on our hearts and minds that we wish to be lifted up in the group of community here gathered. So if you have a joy or sorrow, please raise your hand and we'll take those in the room first and then those online. And Hector's gonna begin by those we've received by email ahead of time. For those joys and sorrows that are present in our hearts but are left unspoken, we light one additional candle that they too are shared in loving community. Our words for prayer or meditation today come from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and so that means that they come from a Christian context, and I hope that those of us who are not Christian and maybe not even theist like myself um, can translate into your own words. Oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the creative insights in the universe. We thank thee for the lives of great saints and prophets in the past who have revealed to us that we can stand up amid the problems and difficulties and trials of life and not give in. We thank thee for our foreparents who've given us something in the midst of the darkness of exploitation and oppression to keep going. And grant that we will go on with the proper faith and proper determination of will so that we will be able to make a creative contribution to this world and in our lives. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Blessed be. Amen. Our next hymn was Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite hymn. He asked for it to be sung um, at the thing he was preparing for right before his death, and it was sung by Mahalia Jackson at his funeral, as well as many times throughout his life. Precious Lord, take my hand. It is in your hymnals, number 199 in the gray ones. Please rise and body your spirit. As I said to the children in talking about the Ware Lecture, the Ware Lecture is an old series of lectures named for Henry Ware, a um, 
professor appointed to an endowed chair at Harvard, which sparked the uh, Unitarian schism off of the Congregational Church back in the 1800s. And the lecture series has been going ever since. And Martin Luther King is one who gave it and in 1966. And then um, before that, or after that, I mean, sorry, we've had the likes of um, Cornell West and many other popular and notable figures in the United States. And so I encourage you to watch the Ware Lecture this year at General Assembly. Martin Luther King um, spoke this, it was shortly after the um, Voting Rights Act had been passed, it was a year later. And so he's speaking to a Unitarian Universalist audience that consists of a lot of people. Um, 200 UU ministers had gone down to march in Selma in 65. And so he's introduced by one of them, our UU president, and then he talks about how we should not sleep through the revolution. And towards the end he says this, Modern psychology has a word that has become common. It is the word maladjusted. We read a great deal about it. It is a ringing cry of modern child psychology, and certainly we all want to live the well-adjusted and avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But I must say to you this evening, my friends, there are some things in our nation and in our world to which I'm proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon you to be maladjusted and all people of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of people perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of prosperity. I must honestly say, however much criticism it brings, that I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and to the self-defeating effects of physical violence. In a day when Sputniks and Geminis are dashing through outer space and ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win a war. It is no longer a choice between nonviolence and violence. It is now a choice between nonviolence and non-existence. The alternative to disarmament under a strong UN, the alternative to a suspension of nuclear tests, the alternative to a negotiated settlement in Vietnam, and the point of coming to that condition of not bombing the North, the alternative to admitting China may well be a civilization plunged into the abyss of annihilation, and our earthly habitat can be transformed into an inferno that even the mind of Dante could not imagine. Yes. I must confess that I firmly believe, I believe firmly that our world is in a dire need of a new organization, the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. <laughs> Men and women as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of injustices of his day, cried out in words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thus ends our reading, and at this time we will now gratefully receive the gifts of the congregation, which are split between the work of this church and the good work of RIA, Inc., which means Ready, Inspire, Act, more about which can be found in your order of service. Bye. 
question again. Um, as I begin, let me start with two caveats. Uh, the first is because there's a lot of talk, especially in this part of the country, about plagiarism lately, let me say that if you were to log on this morning to the, for, to the UU Church in Detroit's website and listen to their service, you would find that their minister, Julie Brock, and my sermon have a lot of similarities, not necessarily in individual words, but in structure. And that's simply because yesterday we were both stuck on our sermons, and we talked with each other, and we were talking about how both of us had chosen the title Liberating Love, and we were both stuck, because while Martin Luther King had a lot to say about love, it's not some of the words that lead us to understand most readily the work of justice. And so we were stuck in this pattern of like, what do we say about liberating love? And we talked through our sermons together and basically created a, a structure for our sermons that are the same, roughly speaking, or at least the first part of which are the same for what we're preaching today. So that's, it's not plagiarism, it's collaboration. Secondly, there's been a sort of debate in Unitarian Universalist circles lately about whether or not it's the right thing for UU churches, particularly churches that are largely white and in the suburbs, to have a Martin Luther King Day service. Is it paying lip service? Is it just sort of whitewashing Martin Luther King Jr. because we like to lift up those beautiful and eloquent and passionate words but not actually dig down into the work of justice and sometimes we were people who didn't really engage with the work of justice when it was happening during his lifetime. It's an open question. I think, therefore, it's good for us to not dwell in his words as much on this Sunday, although I'm using them for opening words and closing words, but that our sermons should be about the work that is now and how we take his words and live into it in the now. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. But I want to do it talking about three moments in Martin Luther King's life that I see, and I'm sure there were more, but there are three that have always spoken to me where he specifically was reaching out to white people and to white liberals to talk to them about the work. The first of those was the letter from the Birmingham jail in 1963. And that was a letter written to white clergy, and specifically white clergy, and so it always has spoken to me as a white clergy person, right? But he was specifically writing to the white clergy who had written an article or a letter saying, oh, he goes too far. That his, his, his methods of nonviolence should be, are, are too much and that his protests are too much and we should just step back and things will evolve into the way they should be in time. And Martin Luther King wrote this very powerful letter in response, the letter from the Birmingham jail, while he was jailed for the work that he was doing. We often think of him as, you know, that he was a leader of a nonviolent movement, but he was met with violence over and over again. So his nonviolence was not a simple thing. It was a difficult and hard felt path that he encouraged us to pursue, this path of nonviolence. And he was beaten for it, he was jailed for it, ultimately he was killed for it. The second moment where I see him reaching out to white liberals and specifically to Unitarian Universalists, is when we had the March on Selma. So in 1965, Jimmy Lee Jackson is killed in the work of voter rights registration in the Selma area. He was actually killed in Marion, Alabama. And what the civil rights leaders decide to do in response to keep people focused in their anger and to get attention to the issue is to organize a march from Selma where things were happening and not happening in voter registration to the state capitol in Montgomery. In their first march, they had about 500, 600 marchers, civil rights workers, all of them, and they get onto the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they're beaten back, right? They're literally beaten. John Lewis gets a, lacer gets a skull fracture that gives him a scar that he'll carry for the rest of his life. Numerous other people beaten on that bridge and it's broadcast on the news that this has happened. Out here in the Boston area, James Reeb is watching television, watching the Nuremberg trials, and it's interrupted with news of this 
beating in Selma. And he, gets, and he and his wife are very moved by that. The next day, Martin Luther King puts out the call, asking white people, come down. White liberal people, white religious liberal people, come down and march with us. And he puts out a telegram to the UUA, among other places. And the UUA, Homer Jack, receives that telegram, and he starts making calls, calling the UU ministers who he thinks can pick up and go. About 40 of them do, including James Reed from there in Boston, who was working at that time for the American Friends Service Committee in Roxbury. And they go down and join the second march, which was two days later, on what would be called Turnaround Tuesday, because they get bridge, met by the police and everything. They say, you don't have to permits to march. I believe Martin Luther King kneels and prays, and, or anyway, prays, and then they turn around and go back, turn around Tuesday. That night, after dining in a restaurant that was one of the only places that black and white people could eat together, James Reed is beaten and eventually dies from those wounds. And his death becomes a galvanizing force for more people to flock down to Selma. About the, the second march, the first march was five to 600, second march is like 1,500 to 2,000, third march is like 6,000 or something, people who come down to march in Selma. And I think that's probably the point at which one of our members, Nali Shrivastava, went down. Because that's the point at which the UUA board um, cancels the rest of their meeting or tables it, and they all flock down. The word goes out to all the churches over in Atlanta. The minister there says, everybody go, and if you can't go, send blankets. You know, numerous ministers from my home state of Michigan go down. I'm sure dozens from here in Boston area go down. And 6,000 people march to, and this time make it all the way over a five-day march to Montgomery. And on the ferrying people back from Montgomery to Selma, Unitarian Universalist Viola Liuzzo is shot and murdered, a layperson from Detroit. Her death is not well covered, and in fact, she's even blasted, and um, horrible things are said about her in the press. Um, but James Reed's death becomes this galvanizing force. Martin Luther King preaches his eulogy a few days between, between the two, March three and two and three, and the president himself takes notice at the death of James Reed and mentions James Reed in his speech when he passes a few months later the Voting Rights Act. So that's the second moment where I think white liberals are specifically reached out to to join civil rights. But then a year later, 1966, Martin Luther King comes to the UUA General Assembly. And he knows when he's talking to the people that he's talking to a lot of people who did join with him in Selma. You know, the president of the UUA who gives the introduction, he was there in Selma. Numerous other people in the audience were there in Selma. But he's not sitting there to say thanks at the General Assembly and say, job well done, we passed the Civil Rights, the Voting Rights Act, and we're, we can, we're free and clear. No, he's telling us to stay awake through the revolution. The revolution has not yet come. And he's talking about, he talks about four things in specific in that speech that we need to do to stay awake through the revolution. The first is that we need to have a global attitude. We need to have a worldview about this revolution to come. We need to not just be looking in the here and the local, we need to be looking at the entire world. And the second, and third are about civil rights in particular, that we need to acknowledge that the civil rights work isn't done and that it exists and that black and white people should be equal. And then the fourth point he makes is, let me remember, um, that, ah, my brain. So, because that's where I wanted to focus on my thoughts, of course, was on that fourth point that I almost can't remember. There are two myths, I'm gonna come back to the fourth point, two myths we have to avoid before we can do the work. One is we have to avoid the, the myth that legislation doesn't matter. And the idea that all that matters is changing people's hearts and changing people's minds. 
and that it doesn't really matter politics and legislation. And Martin Luther King is very specific about it. He's this, the work of the revolution isn't just changing our minds. The work is getting out there in the trenches. The work is getting out there and doing the work of justice, not just working on ourselves and working on our conversations with our neighbors and our cousins and our parents and our kids. The work is getting out there and changing the legislation because that will make a difference. The Voting Rights Act is already making a difference when just changing hearts couldn't. The second myth that we need to overcome is that the myth that we have basically achieved it all. Because the Voting Rights Act had passed, right? And the work is done. And this is the myth, I think, that we as Unitarian Universalists today need to still listen to Martin Luther King about and not think, oh, the work is done. And all we need to do is just change our hearts. Because the answer is, we need to change the world. We need to keep that global view. And if anything is still true, and even more true than it was in King's day, it's that global view is necessary, right? He was talking before the internet, or before the very beginnings of the internet were starting, and he was talking before we had cell phones in our pockets, but in which we could, if I had pockets, which we could use to Google his words and Google what's happening over here and there, know what the weather is like across the United States and across the world. We have this technology now that links us to the entire world at a time. We can look up the weather in the Ukraine. We can look up the death toll in Gaza. And we need to keep that global view. So I'm going to go look up that fourth point, because that's where I want to go from here. I'm not a perfect extemporaneous preacher yet, if I don't keep notes in front of me. Scrolling down. Scrolling down, because I've told you a lot already. Um, Ah, so here's the bit about love, and this is the part I need to quote. He said this about love and hope. Throw us in jail, and we will still love you. Double night. Threaten our children, bomb our homes, send your hood hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at midnight hours, and drag us out on some wayside road and beat us and leave us half dead. And. As difficult as it is, we will still love you. Send your propaganda agents around the nation and make it appear as if we are not fit morally, culturally, or otherwise for integration, and we will still love you. But be assured that we will wear you down by our capacities to suffer, and one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves, but will so appeal to your conscience that we will win you in the process and our victory will be double victory. This is our message in the nonviolent movement when we are true to it. So I'm going to scroll back up and find that fourth point for you. First, we need to cha be challenged inside ourselves with the world perspective. Second, it's necessary for the church to reaffirm over and over again the essential immorality of racial segregation. Third, there is another thing that the church must do to remain awake, and I think it's necessary to refute the idea that there are superior and inferior races. And then, haha, -ha, how could I forget this? Because it's so basic. The next thing the church must do to remain awake through this revolution is to move into the arena of social action. Clear, right? To remain awake, we have to do social action. Now, this has been kind of something of a debate in our church lately, is, um, and in our faith as a whole. Are we a social justice religion? Are we a social justice organization? Or are we a spiritual religion? And I've been making the case all fall that that's a false dichotomy, right? And that this may be a justice-oriented sermon, but it's still religious. 
And I think Martin Luther King lies at the heart of that nexus, right? He was the most amazing social justice leader, one of the most amazing anyway, of our time, of the modern era. And he was a preacher. He was based in God and based in a theology of love that was amazing. And so here we are, the church of the modern era. And when you think about it, we have a justice wing called Side with Love. And that's based in this ethic of love that Martin Luther King was talking about. We're rewriting our UUA Article 2. And if it passes at this General Assembly, we'll have removed our principles and we will put in place values. And at the heart of it, the center of it, we will say that love is the motive force of Unitarian Universalism. We say every week in our covenant, what? Love is the spirit of this church. And we might debate over that whole next line of servants, it's law. I was debating with someone about that. The word law is a little bit rough, but love is the spirit of this church. And so I wanted to end with that concept because I think that is the most important thing about how we stay awake through the revolution. This love that Martin Luther King is talking about, it is no easy thing but it is the heart of our faith. It's why our service organization is called Side with Love. It's why at our General Assembly we'll be talking about moving love into the heart of our Article 2. It's why we, pre we say it in unison every week. Because with that change or not, love at General Assembly, love is the center of our faith. And it's love in action that King was calling us to. And that love is awake. And that love leads us into social action and leads us to revolution. So, with that, stay woke, friends. Don't sleep through the revolution. We're going to engage in it here at FPC. May it be so. Our closing hymn, Love Will Guide Us. Please stand in body and spirit. So remember, my friends, social action is necessary. Keep a world perspective. Avoid the myths of that we're already there and that we only need to change our hearts and minds. And remember, racism is still very real. And with that, I close with these words of Martin Luther King Jr. from his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That's why right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. I believe that even amid today's mortar bursts and whining bullets, there is still hope for a brighter tomorrow. I believe that wounded justice 
lying prostrate on the blood-flowing streets of our nation, can be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down, men other-centered can build up. I still believe that one day mankind will bow before the altars of God and be crowned triumphant over war and bloodshed, and nonviolent redemptive good will proclaim the rule of this land. And the lion and the lamb shall lie down together, and every man shall sit under his own vine and fig tree, and none shall be afraid. I still believe that we shall overcome. Maybe so. Thank you. 